I'm Caroline Hyde. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Big Tech declares for the first quarter and Amazon's bet on the cloud sends first quarter sales through the roof. We'll crunch the numbers. Plus, Alphabet survives its ad platform backlash and unleashes a banner first quarter. We'll highlight the numbers across the board. And Microsoft concerns bubble to the surface. Shares dropped from record highs after the third quarter report. We explain why. First to our lead, Amazon shares popping in extended trading. I want to be bringing you up where we are currently performing because up about 4% in trading after record highs hit on Thursday. Just type in GIPO into your Bloomberg on the Amazon ticker. There we are, up 3.6%. 3, 3 the e-commerce giant reported a 23% increase in sales and a profit of $724 million in its quarterly report. And the company's cloud services arm, AWS, reported 43% increase in sales. Founder and CEO Jeff Bezos highlighted the company's success as it pushes into international expansion, particularly in India. Joining us from Cambridge, James Wakivi. He's Principal Analyst at Forrester Research. And here with us in the studio, Jatendra Worrell of Bloomberg Intelligence. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Let's uh, take it to you, Jatendra, first, because Give us a quick snapshot. We got a significant beat in earnings per share. Revenue pretty much in line, but still growing at a, quite a clip. And it is still largely about cloud. AWS, Prime, and FBA. They're executing well on all cylinders. That's what they're basically showing. So the whole investment cycle that Amazon embarks on, they're saying that, hey, we can deliver the top line growth, so be okay if we increase that spending to bolster our, our growth story here. Uh, from a profit perspective, again, you know, AWS, biggest contributor, uh, the North America margins are steady, but the international uh, sort of losses continue because they're expanding very aggressively there, and they have a lot of opportunities to expand Prime internationally, FBA, internationally so I think there's this, this growth uh, runway continues but more importantly they're showing that they can execute against these numbers I want to dive into my Bloomberg again because it's quite phenomenal just to show even though we're at these lofty heady heights of near records for Amazon we have got not one single sell on this stock across all analyst recommendations largely they are buys a few holds overall but still the stock trades higher and after hours let's get james mckeevy's point of view because was it aws a standout for you as well as prime what about some of the margins that we're seeing coming from amazon Certainly, we're happy to see AWS perform so well. There was some softening in the last quarter, and so it was good to see the numbers come back up. Uh, but really, for this company in the long run, we need to see that it can fire on all these cylinders, and it is firing on those cylinders, but the U.S. business in particular. The margins are small, will continue to be small, but we're really confident that it will continue to grow, even at small margin, year after year after year. There is still so much headroom in the U.S. retail business for Amazon to claim that between a high growth product like AWS and a really solid domestic retail business that's growing and growing, I think that's what's gonna to fuel together the international expansion that they're working on. Interesting, both of you have talked about international expansion here. Jatendra, oh, I think it's really interesting that the earnings press release led with India. This is such a clear sign of intent coming from Amazon. Absolutely. And if you just look at their investments and even their strategies, which are regionally different, their pricing strategies are also different. I mean, it's, it's basically telling you that, you know, they are expanding by localizing uh, their strategy, which is really working for them. I mean, Mexico, also a new area that they're launching, Prime. What about the content side of the business, James? What about with Amazon Prime comes, of course, the Amazon Fire Stick and Fire TV. They are spending big as ever. This is a company that reaps in that revenue but doesn't always deliver on profitability. Right. Well, a, a real way to think about the video focus, any other content focus of Amazon, is how do we increase the engagements, number of engagements per day and minutes of engagement per day. You can even think of Amazon Echo and Alexa as an extension of that. If we get you to touch Amazon in some way eight, ten times a day, and that can include video, that can include asking Alexa what's the weather, all of that eventually accrues to, I'm going to shift a larger percentage of my retail spend to Amazon. So. Even though that's not generating top line dollars for them, it is cementing what is undoubtedly the industry's most powerful customer relationship. And to turn to what, I mean, where next in terms of can Amazon possibly go? I mean, we're seeing record highs across the board for many of these stocks. I'm, I'm looking at Amazon with $439 billion market cap. It's about to grow if it holds on to those after our trading numbers. Are you expecting just 
continued positivity coming from Amazon. As he mentioned uh, now that, you know, these touch points that Amazon keep adding with, you know, with video, with the AI assistance, with different products and services, just brings people back to prime. Once people are back to prime, they spend more. And so this cycle has a, a long runway because if you look at the end markets, there are a lot of verticals that they are just starting to enter. There are, so, and there are international markets where there's a lot of room for headroom for the retail segment. And of course, the cloud business, which you know continues to sort of beat expectations in terms of how big is this market, and that number keeps on going up. So I think they have end markets big enough to sort of like support that growth longer term it's just the balancing act of how much should we invest in and continuing to show these positive ROI numbers uh, through revenue growth James I'm gonna ask this when we to our guests when we discuss alphabet but how worried should alphabet be by the growing advertising side of the business that Amazon is starting to show off and and it, are these really key competitors we see them fighting it out in cloud as well Absolutely. These are probably two of the most unlikely competitors that people for years tried to separate mentally, but they are in the same business. It's the business of attention. And if you think specifically about advertising, uh, Amazon is in a position to give you much more contextual ad placement than Google is. Even though you're working against search results, that's not nearly as powerful as product search results. So Amazon, and then when you add what Amazon can do when it starts observing you in your life with cameras that it, as of this week, has added to some of its Alexa uh, Echo line, it's going to be in a position to know so much about you and make product recommendations that surpass the value of advertising, coming at a time when major brands like P&G are pulling back billions of ad dollars, which they're not sure are spent well. If I'm Google, I'm Alphabet, I'm very nervous. Well, we'll see how they react and how and we go on with this discussion. But fascinating points of view from both of you. James McKivy, of course, Principal Analyst at Forrester Research and Jatendra Worrell of Bloomberg Intelligence. Fascinating insights into, well, a stock that just keeps on giving. Now, as we mentioned, several tech giants reporting earnings. Microsoft reporting a 16% jump in their earnings from the same period a year ago. The company is continuing to see growth in its cloud software business. Its Azure unit grew 93% from a year ago. But shares lower in after hours trading. We'll dig into why there seems to be concern about, of course, the surface, their particular PC part of the business. Now, looking at chipmaker Intel, results fell in line with estimates and raised its full year view. But the numbers fell short in its data center business. We have more coverage in reaction to those results later in the show. Do stay tuned. Now, coming up, we continue to break down all the tech earnings. Up next, Alphabet surging in post-market after beating on its results. This is Bloomberg. Let's continue on the tech earnings bonanza. This time, Alphabet. Here's a quick breakdown for you. Revenue jumped 22% from a year ago at just over $20 billion. Paid clicks were up 44%, beating industry expectations a long way. While revenue from its other bets unit, which makes up businesses like Waymo and Nest, showed improvement, generating $244 million in the period. And investors are pleased. Shares surging as well post-market, currently seeing it up 4.2% if you type in GIPO on your Alphabet ticker on the Bloomberg. So both Amazon and Alphabet really ticking higher. And remember, both near or at record highs already. Alphabet now worth $610 billion. Let's get more reaction. Joining us from New York, Harry Kargman, CEO of Cargo, which focuses on digital and mobile advertising. And from Washington, Mike Bailey, Director of Research at FBB Capital Partners, wealth management firm with clients invested in Alphabet stock. Let's get the investor take first. Mike, how are you looking at these numbers? Any sort of concerns for you? Because it beats across the board. Yeah, no, no major concerns. Uh, you know, we think it's a pretty, pretty clean beat. Uh, in fact, we're, we're a bit surprised uh, the stock is uh, not up more. I mean, the, the earnings beat by about 4%. Stock is up 4%. So in our minds, you know, investors are treating this as the same company it was uh, before the earnings came out. You know, I think in our minds, this is a higher quality company. Uh, and investors have really not uh, sort of, they're not showing that in terms of rising sentiment. So we're, we're still uh, as confident uh, in Alphabet as we were uh, before the earnings came out. So Mike's confident. Harry, I want to get your point of view here because I've been speaking to an executive at Alphabet and asking, look, what about the YouTube controversy surrounding all of this? What about the backlash from advertisers and perhaps the slowing down of wanting to link yourself with certain videos? And they said, actually, look, this is only going to be a modest effect in the medium term. In the longer term, 
we might actually see some improvement as they change the business. But are there worries surrounding this, Harry? Well, I think that in Q1, it's not going to affect the business. This ad boycott only really happened in the last month or so. And it really started in the UK and it's spreading to the US. If you really look at YouTube as a entity, um, most of its revenue is generated from the small to mid tail of advertisers. And it really is a one-stop shop for them. For the largest brand advertisers who really want to be in brand safe places, uh, YouTube is a scary place to run. And it really wasn't built for those large scale brand advertisers. Now, YouTube was sort of caught proverbially with its pants down where there's now a lot of press around uh, great advertising and great advertisers running against hate speech and other problematic content. But what you're seeing is that Google is uh, now having to approach this problem and deal with it. And I think there's a little bit of chinks in the, in the armor of YouTube going forward and trying, uh, trying to deal with this. Jinx in the armor, Mike, you're not worried about YouTube at all? Uh, we're not too concerned. Uh, you know, I was actually uh, uh, waiting to, to come on here and I was watching you earlier with the, the commentary that uh, you know, Google only expects a, a modest impact here. Uh, I think that, that's very telling. You know, I think this was a, a major blow to, to potentially sentiment, uh, a blow to uh, sort of the, the PR for, for uh, Google. Uh, and here they are, and it's only going to have a modest impact. So I think in our minds, uh, they're, they've, been a, they've done a pretty good job of sort of identifying the problems, working to, to correct it. Uh, and our sense is you know, the, uh, Google is seeing basically uh, everything from the inside, and they're really just not seeing a major impact yet. So I would typically uh, go with uh, some of that commentary in terms of the, the forward impact. Harry, if we're moving away from YouTube in particular and looking at other areas, what about, we were all very concerned about the money being plowed into so-called moonshots. Ruth Porat, the CFO, came in, got a rain on it. Do you feel now more at ease that perhaps they've, they've got a handle on their spending? Well, I don't think it, it's made a major contribution to their revenue. You can see from their numbers that the core business is still advertising across search and, and video. Um, you know, I think that they are going to be careful about uh, spending their money in, in the right places. I think the, the key thing for them is they have to find that next growth area. Um, you know, who knows whether these types of problems associated with uh, content are going to have long-term effects on uh, their video business. I think search is, is pretty safe, um, but their video business, I think, over the long term, if, it, if it's not seen as a safe place for brands to run, I think it will have a material impact. Uh, you may not see it next quarter or even the quarter after, but I think over the next few years, you'll see that there isn't that plowing of, you know, 80% of video budgets into YouTube digitally. Um, and so these moonshots really are a way for them to diversify their revenues into different areas. And maybe diversification is what's needed when you suddenly seem to have Amazon potentially becoming a threat on, on men, multiple fronts. I really want to get uh, overall the investor take here, Mike, on whether you think Amazon is a key threat now in terms of advertising, in terms of cloud. Yeah, absolutely. And I did hear your earlier uh, guest. Sounds like he's a little bit more concerned that uh, you know, Amazon may be getting into uh, Google's territory here in terms of, of advertising. Uh, we're, we're a little less concerned here. Uh, if, if we sort of pull back and, and sort of look at this quarter's earnings uh, and look at uh, all the different uh, sort of dynamics here, uh, we're seeing ri rising barriers to entry. And we're actually seeing that across basically all the FANG stocks. Uh, so we're seeing that you know, for, for Amazon, for Alphabet, et cetera. Uh, our, our sense, and particularly for the advertising space, and you know, uh, specifically for Google, for Facebook, you're seeing very high uh, sort of barriers to entry that, that continue. So in, in our minds, as we sort of pivot over to uh, Amazon and ask the question, are they going to get into Google's ad business, uh, we think that, that Google's got a pretty big head start. We think it, it may be uh, somewhat difficult for Amazon to really uh, make uh, some, some gains there. And I think in our, in our minds, uh, Amazon, they've got plenty of other growth drivers. In our, in our mind, this is sort of down their agenda in terms of what they want to do for growth. So at this point, we're really uh, not too yeah. concerned about, uh, about uh, competition there. Frenemies for now. The shares continue to trade high for both Alphabet and Amazon. It's great to have your perspective. Harry Kargman, CEO of Cargo, and Mike Bailey, Director of Research at FBB Capital Partners. Thank you both. Now coming up, our exclusive interview with PayPal CFO John Rainey. We'll dig into PayPal's strategy for growth in the ever-crowded digital payments industry. This is Bloomberg.
Now, PayPal shares popped over 6% in trading on Thursday. Investors are embracing the company's strategy of converting the online payments platform into a digital wallet. First quarter results show that CEO Dan Shulman's strategy is working as the company raises its annual forecast. Now, I spoke with the CFO, John Rainey, earlier about the company's focus on partnerships. Partnerships has been a big part of our strategy when we made a pivot about a year ago, uh, starting with some announcements with Visa, but those have been followed on with announcements with Facebook, Alibaba, and most recently uh, you see Google. And the, the, the space around payments and with the, the combination of, uh, of uh, online and offline continuing to merge, it's, uh, it increases the addressable market. And it's one where we believe the right strategy is to partner with others and build on their strengths that complement the strengths of PayPal. A lot of it you're now focusing on is payments. What about the credit side of the business? Because there's been talk about perhaps spinning off that, that particular area of offering loans and, and, and credit to, to people and businesses. Is this something, you talk of an asset light future, is that something that you can explain for us, please? Sure, that's a great question, Caroline. And, and I'll tell you, we have a, a credit product that complements the holistic suite of payment offerings for our customers. And our merchants and our consumers love it. So we want to continue to be in the credit business. But to your very point, uh, we can do it in a less capital intensive manner. Today we've got over $5 billion of consumer credit receivables on our balance sheet. And so what we're exploring are, are options where we can partner with other issuers or, or even maybe do just a strict, a pure asset sell uh, so that we can free up that cash and use it for capital allocation to what is perhaps higher returning investments. What sort of higher return investments are you analyzing? Well, the, the, I think most importantly is investing in ourselves. Uh, we're a growth company that's growing revenue almost 20% a year, so we need to continue to invest for tomorrow. At the same point in time, a key pillar of our strategy is acquisitions. And there are a lot of acquisitions that help fill in holes maybe that we have or, or white space where we are uh, globally. And lastly, uh, we've got uh, the balance sheet and the, the cash generation to distribute cash to shareholders. And we just announced this quarter that, uh, that we increased our, our share buyback authorization to $5 billion following the $2 billion one we announced last year. So shareholders get an uptick. You talk about the white space that potentially could be analyzing for acquisitions. What sort of white space? Where do, which gaps do you want to be filling in? Well, certainly if you look across the world, uh, whether it's, it's Asia or getting down to Africa, parts of Europe, there, there are markets that we're not uh, penetrated in to the extent that we'd like. And importantly, we talk about democratizing money. If you think about uh, emerging economies broadly, there are two billion people in emerging economies that don't have access to, to basic things that you and I take for granted, like a checking account, a savings account, uh, having a mortgage on their home. And the benefit of fintech with what we can do with a, a mobile phone and mobile technology is put all the power of a bank branch in the palm of their hand. And so there, there's a huge addressable market for us and many others to play in. So fascinating. Maybe we reach into the emerging markets. What I'm really interested in is also some of the products that are currently available here in the United States. I'm yet to see it perhaps moving its way to the UK. But talk to us about Venmo because this is largely free. But how do you think that this might be monetized? Is it all about user engagement? Is that what it's driving at the moment? Well, Venmo is about user engagement. It's also about customer acquisition. It is one of the, the largest vehicles that we have for acquiring customers today. And it truly is a, a viral app. And, and when we think about Venmo, what's unique about Venmo is that it combines not only payments, peer-to-peer -peer payments, but a social experience as well. 90% of Venmo users have, have opened up the, the social feed uh, on, the, on the platform so they can share that experience with their friends. And that's of huge value to merchants because there's, there's really high fidelity in what one individual does in terms of their purchasing patterns and its influence on other individuals. We're just now launching Pay With Venmo, which is enabling uh, us to expand from just a peer-to-peer -peer platform with Venmo, Venmo to where uh, our customers can pay with Venmo at stores. And certainly merchants are looking forward to that as well. There's also talk of competition in this area, and Apple is said to be analyzing a Venmo rival. Would that be a concern? Competition is nothing new to us. It's, uh, this is 
uh, as I suggested, it, there's a huge addressable market, and, and certainly there's a, a lot of excitement in fintech in general, and that's why you see uh, the level of competition that, that, that we realize today. But, but in the face of that competition, we've been able to grow our revenue uh, upwards of uh, 20%, continue to expand our operating margins, and generate free cash flow margins 20 to 25%. So it's, it's, it's nothing new for us, and it's candidly what gets us up each morning and excited about uh, uh, facing the day. And sometimes competition can become frenemies, and we've seen you strike a, a very interesting deal and one that is thought as very wise among the analyst group is, of course, working with Android in terms of integrating into Android Pay. What about integrating into Apple Pay? Would we see those sorts of deals being struck? Yeah, well, whether it's Apple Pay or, or any other technology platform, one of the, the great aspects about uh, PayPal is that it's truly technology agnostic. We can, it can be used across any platform, any mobile device across the world. And so our aspiration is to partner with all of those major technology players to, to allow our customers, most importantly, to use PayPal whenever they want and wherever they want. That was PayPal CFO John Rainey there. Coming up, Microsoft's earnings showing a slow in momentum. We'll dig into the numbers and what's next in the company's transition to cloud computing. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio, why don't you? You can now listen on the Bloomberg radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the US on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde. And we return to our top tech story of the hour, of course, it's earnings. We passed through Amazon and Alphabet. Now on to Intel. Seems its best business, the server chips, isn't living up to the company's expectations. Intel's data center group had sales of $4.2 billion. That's below the company's long-term goal of double-digit percentage growth. Under Chief Executive Officer Brian Krasanich, Intel is trying to spread its bets away from a personal computer market that's been declining since it's peaked in 2011. Shares of Intel down almost 4% as we speak on the Bloombergs. So watch out for that stock as we open tomorrow. Now to another PC exposed business. Microsoft also reporting results. Now cloud revenue continues to grow, but the company missed estimates, particularly on its personal computing side of the business. Anurag Rana covers Microsoft for Bloomberg Intelligence and joined us now from New York. And it does seem to be the more com personal computing bit of the business that seemed to be disappointing. Caroline, the PC's numbers were okay, but it was the Surface tablets, that number that came out uh, below. And one of the comments we read uh, you know, on the tape was that um, the, there were some older models that were the, likely the reason for this downfall. Now, we see this in hardware cycles. When you have newer models come in, you know, the growth will come back. Um, you know, for us, the bigger issue is to talk about the enterprise and the cloud business where the numbers were very strong. Yeah, talk to us, therefore, about the real growth area. This is the number two player in the market, and yep. what sort of rampant growth are we seeing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, they grew Azure about 94%. Now, if you compare that with Amazon Web Services, well, you know, grew about 43% this quarter. Now, granted that Amazon is much larger than Microsoft in this business, but they are a very strong contender as number two. And also, their legacy product business actually grew as well. And one of the things that we've been talking about is that as legacy enterprises move their infrastructure to the cloud, they would need a company that is very strong both on-premise as well as the cloud. And if you look Look at across all different technology companies off in cloud services, you know, Microsoft really foots the bill into, into that description. I mean, I'm just looking on my Bloomberg and digging into the segmentation of Microsoft. 44%, this is full year 2016, 44% was more personal computing, how much of the business depended on that. But 27% is cloud as we speak, intelligent cloud, they call it. Yep. How much bigger, how much of the business of Microsoft could the intelligent cloud become? See, that's a, it's a very small portion of global IT spending right now. If you look at total tech spending, it's about a trillion and a half. If you look at public cloud spending, you know, according to IDC or any estimates, it's somewhere around 100, 200 billion. So we still at a very, very early innings when it comes to cloud adoption, whether it's on the application side, the platform side, or the infrastructure side. Um, there is a lot of growth for everybody in this business going forward. So when we're looking at the shares down at the moment after hours, about a percentage point, is this largely in part because they've been at record highs? Yes. 
Uh, if you look at it, the expectations for not just Microsoft, but a lot of tech companies have been very high going into the quarter. Um, and they have been at you know close to all time high for a very long, uh, you know, for the last several days. Um, you know, all of that included with you know this miss that we uh, talked about on Surface tablets. I think is the reason why you're seeing the stock down. But it's you know to be honest, as you said, it's not down uh, you know more than percentage or two. Yeah, and still a hefty $520 billion valuation, so maybe not one that Microsoft's too upset about. Anurag Rana, great to have your perspective as ever. Bloomberg Intelligence, thank you. Sticking with Microsoft, the world's number two cloud platform is nipping at Amazon's heels that we've been discussing after signing a few high-profile customers recently. Ahead of the company's earnings results, we spoke with Judson Althoff. He's Microsoft's Executive Vice President for Worldwide Commercial Business about the growth in this very unit. When enterprises choose to go to the cloud and tr choose to truly digitally transform their businesses, uh, they're choosing to partner with Microsoft. If you take what's happened with UBS, uh, they've chosen to move their risk uh, management solutions to Azure, um, not because it's just a, a motion of moving their assets to the cloud, uh, but as the largest manager of wealth uh, in the world, to them it's critical that they choose a partner that operates in more regions than any other cloud provider and that uh, chooses a partner that adheres to local data sovereignty and security laws. So the investments that we've made in particular for the globally systemic important financial firms uh, are in fact actually what's fueling the growth in financial services. And so we've announced uh, relationships with UBS, with Visa, with MetLife, and with GEICO. Uh, and we're really seeing it fuel a differentiation for our enterprise growth. Are these enterprises ever moving off AWS, off Google to Microsoft, or are they already customers of yours? Um, well, so many of these customers have been uh, Microsoft customers for many, many years. And in fact, it's the trust that they have with Microsoft in the enterprise space uh, that leads them towards uh, choosing us as their preferred cloud platform uh, when it comes to their most important workloads. Uh, we see it uh, as a multi-cloud world. Uh, we think customers will dabble uh, with our competition, uh, but when it comes to uh, building new businesses, truly digitally transforming, establishing new product lines. Uh, they want to uh, go with, frankly, a partner they trust and one that they've trusted for, for many years. Uh, and so many of them are choosing Microsoft as their enterprise cloud partner. And what about the move to a hybrid cloud? Because many companies have been slightly concerned, maybe more risk averse towards moving purely to a public cloud. You're offering a hybrid stack coming in mid-2017. Is that a real area of growth for you? It's a massive area of growth for us. In fact, and hybrid uh, has been a big part of our strategy for many, many years. Uh, we see customers needing to leverage hybrid, hybrid cloud technologies uh, because the first thing you have to get right in any of these digital transformation scenarios is to get your data estate right. Uh, and so if you operate in a, regular, uh, a highly regulated industry uh, or in many different parts of the world where the public cloud may not be appropriate, the notion of leveraging what you have in your data center and coupling that together uh, with the public cloud to serve serve up a better offering uh, is in fact what we see customers doing today. So the deep uh, intellectual property investments we've made uh, in on-premises technologies for many, many years uh, and the same code lines that we leverage in the cloud allow customers to leverage hybrid cloud uh, with one common investment frame. They can write once uh, and deploy anywhere uh, with the Microsoft public cloud. And so looking at the competitive landscape, AWS owned by Amazon is the number one player. You've got Google saying that they could see their cloud being bigger than their search part of the business. Where does Microsoft see its cloud part of the business going? Well, we're really excited about the momentum we're seeing right now. And to be clear, we are two minutes into a very long game right now. Uh, we like the momentum we're seeing, uh, certainly in some of the biggest growth industries uh, in the biggest markets, uh, from financial services to global trade uh, in the relationship we have announced with Maersk, uh, to aerospace, to the connected car. Um, enterprises are choosing Microsoft, and we see that as a huge competitive advantage uh, that will fuel our growth uh, for many years to come. That was some of my conversation with Microsoft VP of Commercial Business, Judson Althoff. You can catch our full conversation on Bloomberg.com. Now, a story we're watching for you. Foxconn chairman Terry Gu is planning to meet with President Donald Trump in Washington next week. That's according to a report by Nikkei. No word yet on what the two parties will discuss, but manufacturing and trade are likely to be top of the agenda. Now coming up, our exclusive interview with the CEO of Boxed. How the startup is planning to take on Amazon in the battle for household goods. That's next. 
And just to recap, one of the biggest tech earnings of the day, Alphabet shares popping in extended trading, benefiting from a surge in clicks on smartphone ads. We just heard from Alphabet CEO Sundar Pichai on the investor call addressing the YouTube ad backlash. Brands and agencies understand how hard we work to create the safest possible environment. We do this while also being very careful to ensure YouTube's innovative creators can earn money to support their unique and popular content. We've been actively engaged in conversations with clients about the new tools and controls we are providing, and we are having very productive discussions. Now, Amazon shares are continuing to surge on its impressive first quarter earnings report. One company that perhaps might be not so daunted by this competition is Boxed. The startup is betting that its narrow inventory and multi-million dollar automation system will give it an edge over its much larger competitor. Earlier, we spoke with Box CEO, that's Che Huang, for an exclusive interview and started by asking about the company's big bet on automation and what that means for the company's human workforce. Take a listen. We're awfully blessed that our business is growing very, very rapidly. There's this huge shift of consumers buying uh, CPG uh, online these days. And so luckily, it's more about capacity than it is about bottom line dollar savings for us. Uh, I recognize that that's not the case for every company out there. But at least for us, uh, it's more about getting enough packages out the door rather than needing to cut every last person on the uh, warehouse floor. And so, therefore, you can automate its conveyor belts and the like. You're making it more efficient. But surely it means you're going to be able to hire fewer people going forward, though, if with this sort of efficiency. Yeah, going forward, you know, definitely as if, if we did not have automation, uh, anyone out there doing the simple math would, would be able to, to tell that we won't be hiring as quickly. But at the same time, for us, we're awfully loyal to the folks that got us to where we are today. And so that commitment to them stays true and no one will be laid off in our current facilities. I mean, it's actually quite amazing when you look into some of the perks for your employees. You offer them equity, you offer to pay their tuition fees for their children, you offer to pay the weddings of their children. I mean, A, how expensive is a wedding in your mind's eye, but also, like, why? Is this a real opposition, in a way, to the competitor Amazon to show that it's all about the employee base? Well, I, I, I think, uh, we're, actually, message out there is that we're still hiring, Caroline, even for, uh, for news anchors. So if there's any, uh, any life events coming up, you're welcome to apply uh, as, uh, as well. Well, but uh, it really I'm is. Good, um, <laughs> it really is a little bit uh, of of a kind of I don't know. It's a little bit of a contrast as to like us being a technology company, but me and the management team being pretty old school in our in our in our policies and our philosophy towards the folks that work at our company. I would say about a quarter century, maybe even 50 years ago, uh, it was the norm in the country to to really take care of the folks that work for you day in and day out. That's largely gone away over the last 50 years or so, and we're trying to bring that back. And so for us. Um, yeah, sometimes it doesn't make sense on paper, but when you think about all the things that we've benefited from, not only their hard work, but literally the lack of, of, of kind of uh, turnover in our company, I think uh, you start seeing other benefits rather than just looking at a PL all day. Okay, so talk to us therefore about the difference in business model that you have to the larger everything store as we call it, Amazon. They of course have, what is it, 350 million physical products, you have 1,500. How do you pick those sorts of specific wholesale good items to offer to the consumer base? We hire uh, old school merchants and uh, new school merchants and data scientists that, that, that are way better at it than, than I am. Originally we started with 200 items uh, and they were all wrong because I picked them. But now our chief merchant used to be head of Sam's Club West, uh, and now you know, with her 22 years of experience at, at an organization when she had 54,000 people reporting into her organization, uh, she does a way better job than I did in the garage 40 months ago. Uh, but to your point, Caroline, it really is the opposite of what, what Amazon does. I still feel like they do, Amazon does a really good job at being the everything store, but our consumer wants to stock up. Our B2B consumer actually wants to stock up for their businesses. Uh, even here in the Bloomberg uh, office, I see like uh, just a multitude of snacks, drinks, and everything everything upstairs and I'm 120% sure you guys aren't ordering that off Amazon and there's a reason why uh, because that wholesale consumer doesn't want access to everything they want a limited assortment large format only they want to access it with ease uh, and lastly they want a great deal that's only offered if you move a lot of that single UPC so that's core to our business model how much
much more will we see a focus of purchasing online for grocery good items than is currently the case? Can you let us know the sort of penetration you see in the U.S. and also about your global ambitions? The crazy thing here in the U.S. is only like two to three percent, depending on which uh, study you you uh, you look at. In Western Europe, it's as high as ten percent, depending on the country. Uh, but it is not going away anytime soon. And the scary thing is, as the shift kind of gets bigger and bigger, that shift and the speed in which it's shifting is accelerating. So um, I, I think we're awfully blessed that we picked this industry and that we're on the other side of the table. Uh, but, uh, but I think there will be some, some retail pain uh, continuing to, to be kind of pervading throughout the industry. No membership fees. What sort of update do you have for us in terms of numbers of members and, and where you want to grow? Yeah, so from literally tape gun in hand like 40 months ago uh, to now, you know, now we have millions and millions of, uh, of customers. Um, you know, it's widely reported that we've, we've crossed uh, the nine figures in, in, uh, in trailing revenue uh, within less than three years after launch. So uh, I think we're in a good spot. And I think if you're thinking about it as a poker game uh, and thinking about the overall industry uh, and the industry change as a poker game, we think the river card for us is, uh, is a pretty good one. So that's, uh, that's why I have this big uh, smile on my face, but um, I guess I have it all the time, so. <laughs> a very upbeat boxed CEO, Che Huang. Coming up, we continue our coverage of tech earnings, how GoPro's turnaround efforts are faring, that's next. And a feature we'd like to bring to your attention is our interactive TV function. You can find it at TV Go on the Bloomberg. You'll not only be able to watch us live, but also see previous interviews from our coverage around the globe and dive into any of the securities or Bloomberg functions we feature. And you can become part of the conversation by sending us instant messages during our shows. This is for Bloomberg sub subscribers only, though, I'm afraid. Check it out. TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Now, it looks like GoPro's rebounding efforts are showing results. The technology company, known for its action cameras, reported earnings that exceeded sales estimates and narrowed losses. The company, which isn't profitable, reported $218 million in revenue for the first quarter, exceeding average analyst revenue estimates. Joining us now to discuss this and a few other tech headlines that caught our eye is Bloomberg Technology's Selena Wang from New York. Selena, GoPro, a company you've often watched and fall from grace, actually seems to be picking it up a little bit. What was it, 19% increase in revenue? These are really the first signs that their vast turnaround efforts are finally starting to take shape. I just spoke with the chief operating officer who has vowed to cut costs, reduce the bloating of the organization, and really streamline the workforce. And we're starting to see that take shape. They did reduce operating costs. They said they are still trying to reach profitability by the end of this year. And we also saw some new revenue growth areas from the Karma drone finally coming back on the shelves, as well as their Hero 5 camera now recovered from production delays and international growth. So GoPro looks like a ghost story. If we're looking at Baidu, Chinese giant doesn't seem to be looking quite so pretty. Baidu missed uh, forecasts for the second quarter, and they also had a bit of a mixed bag. They only barely beat some of the sales estimates. This is a company that's really faced a lot of headwinds from Alibaba and Tencent. In China, they call it the BATs. And now the B part of the AT has become much diminished. They used to be called, they are very well known as kind of the Google of China, and they used to dominate the online ad market. But now in their core business, they're seeing Alibaba really start to take market share. They've also tried to venture into other businesses like on demand, but even in those other ventures, Alibaba and Tencent are also taking market share. So they're really being attacked at all fronts. And on top of that, they had to recover from some regulatory scrutiny last year. Talking of a competitive landscape, I want to shift from public companies to ones that we all sit and watch and wait as though they will become public. And we're talking ride sharing. I'm thinking of Lyft because it looks as though they've really rather dined out on Uber's turmoil. I received some financials that are actually private and they showed that Lyft is actually really benefiting tangibly from the debacles of Uber over the past few months. We saw ride sh uh, ridership increase dramatically, uh, their uh, gross bookings also increased dramatically, while they still have losses of about $130 million in the fourth quarter fourth quarter, they have paired that significantly from before. So everything is going on the correct track for them as of now. They also recently raised a very large round of funding at a much higher valuation. So while they are still a fraction of Uber's business, these numbers show that they are very well on the way to gaining, continuing to gain market share. 
Absolutely fascinating whirlwind through public, private, through growth, through some issues. Bloomberg Technology reporter Selena Wang, thank you for joining us. I just want to stick on the car theme here because there's a great bit of, bit of news you want to be going into Bloomberg.com for. If you're a Bloomberg terminal user, get in to the Apple ticker because we have got photos of the first Apple autonomous test car. Have a quick look on my screen. There we have it in all its glory. A Lexus, it would seem, white, and looks like it's about to take off from the top. But these have been got by our great reporting staff, Mark Bergen, and indeed, um, we've really been looking at some of the key movements into Apple's autonomous vehicles. And here you have some of the first ever photos. Go to your Bloomberg now, get into Bloomberg.com, go and check them out if you want to see what Apple is trying to do to keep up with the likes of Waymo and Uber when it comes to autonomous vehicles. Now, what a day it has been. Wrapping up the turn at tech earnings bonanza for you. Let's recap some major movers. I want to be looking overall at Alphabet up 3.8%. Amazon, the two key players, we're seeing growth in cloud, but we're also seeing an outperformance in terms of clicking on your adverts on your mobile phones for Alphabet. Amazon is continuing to outperform on a revenue basis. Microsoft didn't look so pretty on the surface part, so the PC a little bit lackluster, down 1.4%. But remember, Microsoft has been at record highs. And Intel, down 4% in after-hours trading as its data center part of the business failed to live up to expectations. I want to have a quick look at my Bloomberg, but just to show you in context how much the fangs you know them facebook alphabet netflix and of course google as well have really been outperforming netflix amazon google facebook all clearly up more than almost 30 percent when you're tuning into facebook over the course of year to date how much do they outperform the stock the s p 500 well just check out that purple line at the bottom of your screens it's been hot in tech for 2017 this is bloomberg <laughs>